How are we doing, everyone? Welcome back to another edition of FSS PGA DFS Pick Show. I am your host, KNation47, joined with John Cool19. John, we are finished with the major season. It was going out with a bang. Uh, I mean, Cam Smith roaring back on the back nine. I'm still a little upset having Rory in the one and done. Um, that would have really propelled me into the money. Uh, I was uh, at one point up to last like 500th place in the one and done when cam was going backwards on Saturday. Um, but to see him come all the way back at the highest ownership of the week, win the event kind of really hurt. So uh, I'm a little yeah. butthurt over the open championship. Don't want to talk about it too much from a DraftKings perspective perspective though. I did fairly well. So uh, I'll take that. And uh, how did you fare on our last major? Uh, yeah, I loved the the watch. It was a really exciting event for me to watch on TV, a lot better than a handful of events we've seen lately, even, uh, in my opinion, better than watching uh, U.S. Open PGA Championship. So that was really cool. You're absolutely right. I was kind of rooting for Rory. Actually, my guy that I really wanted to win was Cam Young on uh, Sunday. Between you and I, we had all three, Cam Young, McElroy, and uh, Cam Smith in our core lineups last week. I played only 10 lineups on DraftKings, cashed in 9 out of 10. I did not have any 6 out of 6 lineups, but I cashed with 9 out of 10 lineups. We were on the gold there. I just missed out on a couple of guys, including Rose. Don't want to talk about that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm super pumped for this week's event. It is just a handful of miles away from my house. A bunch of golfers in town. Loving watching all of the content rolling in from guys already boots on the ground, I think. If there's one event outside of a major that has the most DFS uh, <laughs> touts on the course, it's in Minneapolis. So that's really exciting to see guys actually out there asking questions on uh, practice days. Really excited for this week's event as well. Uh, how are you? Uh, you looking forward to some three? I'm open a little bounce back out of the uh, the open. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, three M open, a really beautiful golf course. Uh, you know, we'll get into that in a minute, but um, really, really nice um, golf course, you know, that's new to the circuit, has produced some really fun winners. Um, you know, Matthew Wolf, I think, had an eagle to beat Bryson and Morikawa. I think that was in its inaugural event. So it really mm -hmm. kicked off with a bang. Unfortunate schedule uh, loss this year being behind the open. Anytime you're ahead or behind a major, you're going to have. Uh, you know, a really weaker field, um, especially when you're behind the event um, like St. Andrews. So it's unfortunate, but hopefully, you know, the PGA next year gives them a, a break and puts them in between, you know, maybe the U.S. Open and in that traveler spot or something like that next year. So they get a better field. So with that being said, let's get into the course TPC Twin Cities. Take it away. Or uh, TPC Twin Cities is in Blaine, Minnesota, just a couple miles north of the Twin Cities. This is a par 71. There are only three par fives this week, uh, 7,400 yards. So it is a little bit longer track, uh, bent grass screens. And this is actually an Arnold Palmer design. I uh, don't have a ton of those out there, but a couple that we can kind of look to uh, to see some bit of correlation. I'm also looking at uh, a handful of other courses, TPC Louisiana. The Detroit Golf Club always seems to come up another birdie fest. Uh, sea Island Resort. A couple others we're kind of including in our comp course uh, for modeling. I kind of like comp courses a little better than course history, especially because we only have the three years to pick from. And years just last year is the same as this year. The week after the major, we know that the field is going to be way down and a, a handful of tired golfers as well. Last year, when it was the week after the major, they uh, of all of the golfers who made the cut at the open, Played all four days and then made the trek. Half of them missed the cut the very next week at the 3M Open. So I would expect something similar this week. Your Tony Finaus, your Sung JM, in those guys and, and the guys down the board a little bit too. Expect about half of them to miss the cut, if nothing else, fatigue. And the temperatures this week, are it is the hottest week of the year so far. We're looking at 100 degree days, which doesn't happen in Minnesota very often. Um, and, and it's muggy. So um today from everyone that was out there it looked a bit better the wind was kind of up which helped uh, but uh, expect it to be hot this weekend 
uh, kind of digging into the course a little bit more. Water comes into play a whole lot this week. Most of that though is off the tee. So if you're looking at the off the tee numbers, we absolutely love drive distance, but really including drive accuracy on there. They're wide fairways, but if you miss the fairways, the trouble here, it, it's right there and it's on a ton of the holes, a lot less so when it comes to approach shots. Yeah, there's a couple like uh, par threes over the water and such, but really the danger is off the tee on the par fours and fives. Um, so big concerns there. So drive accuracy is important as well as a uh, drive distance. Um, Cam Young, what, last year, big win for him. Uh, he is a big driver. We know that about him. He sprays it a little bit, but the, the fairways here aren't what is penal. So spraying it and ending up in the rough, not too bad. Spraying it and ending up in the water, you go backwards here and in a birdie fest, you just can't have uh, very many bogeys or you can't have any double bo double bogeys on the card if you want to win this week so that's what we're kind of looking at there birdies are better opportunities gains certainly are coming into play probably a tick down here this week when it comes to any sort of around the green numbers uh, more focused on approach uh, as well as those off the tee kind of uh, things I spoke about, good drives gained, fairway, fairway accuracy, all that. If you want to hone in on a range, the par fives, all three of them are 550 to 600 yards. You can also toss in uh, par four scoring. The 350 to 400 seems to be the most important, maybe not the most holes on the course. It's pretty spread out on the par fours, but those tend to seem to come into play a bit more when it comes to the scoring. Um, so that's really what I'm aiming at this week. I'm going to include more comp course in my model, as well as just like shots gained on easy courses um, and try and correlate that with guys who get who go low on easy courses. Uh, that's what I'm looking for this week. And uh, hopefully that uh, modeling kind of puts us in the right direction and on some good plays. Awesome. Absolutely. Uh, great breakdown as always. Uh, yeah, I definitely zeroed in on off the tee statistics. I actually thought um, ball striking was a pretty uh, yes pretty large statistic in the in the uh breakdown that i was looking at uh you know guys clubbing down off the tee um you know because of the water that comes into play um you know it kind of brings out you know more three woods or, or irons off the tee for guys that are longer off the tee so i went off off the tee with that uh ball striking uh you know into the modeling this week you know uh, just did some par four scoring, some par five scoring, like you mentioned, par threes from 200 to 225, a lot of 200 plus shots, you know, I thought was interesting. That's what I kind of led me to that ball striking statistic was, wow, plus 200, you know, 200 plus shots were up, you know, because, but, you know, this is a 7,200 yard course. It's not super long. So that told me that might, maybe everyone's clubbing down on, on some specific holes. Sure. All right, let's get into the picks. Uh, I would start off with my favorite here. It is going to be what my value pick of the open, and that is Tony Finau. Uh, 10 5, Tony Finau, um, first in the approach, first in ball striking, second on par four scoring, uh, eighth in birdies are better, six off the tee. I mean, it's Tony Finau. He's the favorite. I'm sure it's going to end poorly for all of us, but I can't quit him. Um, Tony Finau month for me I've, I've been playing a lot of tony fino it's been working out too uh 28th at the open like i mentioned last week 13th at the travelers he gained 5.6 on the approach and he was uh 23rd in this event last year or 28th in this event last year third the year before and 23rd in the inaugural event um so you know as you mentioned earlier that this event did play out after the open last year uh, so he crossed the pond again and, and finished 28th. So I have all the confidence that Tony won't be too, um, too fatigued. I think uh, Finau really is close and uh, we could see another win. He had a win close to this time last year. Uh, so who knows? Um, more to talk about Tony later on, but who's your favorite and what are your thoughts on Finau? Uh, well, my thoughts on Fino is he came out number one overall in my mixed model. Um, I, the biggest thing you could say, the concern about uh, fatigue, um, but I think he's proven before that he can uh, make that trek and still play well. The course history here doesn't seem to be as important as some other courses. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Your, your had wins, your Finos, yes, they've had success, 
Um, but guys like Cam Champ, he had a missed cut uh, prior to his win. Thompson missed cut prior to his win and then didn't finish so well the year after. Um, I don't know that Wolf has played this event, or at least he's certainly not in the field this week. But uh, yeah. but yeah, uh, so course history for me, a little <laughs> bit down, but I'm putting more weight on comp course. And that kind of leads me here to one of my favorite plays this week. That is Davis Riley. He comes out the race very well on comp courses for me. Uh, his form, though, is absolutely electric. He did not not play in the open he did not play in the scottish open either but he has made nine out of his last 10 cuts four of those were top 10 finishes and includes a runner up finish at the valspar when he lost in a playoff to sam burns uh, he is not the golfer sam burns was but certainly in this field i could see him being sam burns popping off and getting himself a win he makes a ton of birdies especially on easy courses that tends to be where he uh exceeds the field the most and then if you look at kind of the stats, he's excellent ball striking, top 10 there. He's good on approach, although he has been excellent just the last couple of events, fifth if you narrow it down, down to just his last three events when it comes to approach. Number two, when it comes to birdies or better, um, kind of more long-term, and he's top 30 in distance also. I think there's a lot to like for Davis Riley. The one question mark with a lot of these guys for me up here, if it's not, did they travel to and from the open, it's – What's their ownership going to be between him, Cam Davis, a couple of these guys? I could see them being easily top two, three, four owned in this field that uh, might push me off of them a little bit in GPPs. I think Davis is probably a cash lock for me to start yeah. my lineups. Uh, him or Cam Davis right next to him, both excellent choices, in my opinion. Give the nod uh, for me uh, for Davis Riley over Cam Davis. Nice. Not bad. I like the uh, I like the pivot. Uh, I was thinking Cam Davis as well. Um, I bet him a few weeks ago, came real close with like a T8. Uh, so I was kind of bumming about that. He was kind of in it too. I'm thinking about going back to the Cam Davis bet, but it's 25 to one, you know, not as, not as advertising. Yeah. Right. Like there's not much juice on that. <clears throat> like if I bet, yeah. you know, like a 25 bucks, I'm only winning 650. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago in a, you know, week, not, a, I shouldn't say weaker field, but in a, I think it was the John Deere. I mean, that field was real, real, gross, real yeah. gross. And I had like a 40 to one on them. So may, maybe it gets higher as the week goes on. I'll, I'll monitor it, but I'm looking into that as well. Good call with the Davis on the, on the, you know, on the round table talk here. All right. Value plays. I'm going to go with a couple of young guns here. Chris got her up. Everyone's talking. Chris got her up. Everyone's betting. Chris got her up. I think if anything, this number is going to go down. So if you see a 45 of 50 out there, Bet Chris got her up. Um, you know, Matthew Wolf came onto the scene three third event, won the, won this event. So that's kind of why I'm going with some of the young gunners here. We got another one in Nick Hardy too. But Chris Crowder up, just want to talk on him a little bit. Um, yeah, fourth in the model this week, 15th on the approach, 18th ball striking, 47th off the tee, uh, and fifth on the opportunities gain. I know that's only 20 rounds, but he's really impressed us this far. Missed cut at the Barbersaw. I think it might have just been a little bit of fatigue. He golfed like three weeks in a row, not maybe used to, um, you know, playing tougher courses like on the PGA Tour. You know, who knows? But missing a cut at the Barbersaw, that is a little concerning, but I'm not going to read into it too much. Uh, he did miss. He did chalk miss cut earlier this year before he went 43 at the U.S. Open, 35th at the John or 35th at the Travelers, and then finished in a top five at the John Deere. So um, John Deere, a little, I would say, in a direct course, uh, comp course, but there's some water, a lot of sand. I mean, that is another TPC course. So, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of correlation there, but uh, I think got her up a fair just well. He might be chalky. Um you know, he might just because everybody's trying to make sure they don't miss out. So uh, if you're looking for maybe a pivot in that range, you know, someone like uh, Brennan Steele at 8,300. I know that's a little ways up, but uh, I think he's a decent pivot. Nick Hardy. I can see, I can see Steele coming in higher ownership than Goddard up here. Uh, really? I think oh. the, the yeah, I think the appropriate uh, um, pivot is, is the next guy you'll talk about. I'll get out of your way. I think he's an excellent pivot from Goddard awesome. up there. Perfect. Yeah. Well, then this is working out great. You have your cash play, got her up your GVP play, Nick Hardy. Uh, Nick Hardy is a guy I've played for two years. I, I mean, I was playing him at the Phoenix Open before he got hurt. Got hurt 
uh, at the end, I believe, of last year or in the early stages of this year. I think it was a back injury, too. So a little concerning or no, it might have been a wrist. Don't quote me on this, but I know he was hurting. He, out, he was out for an extended period of time, but he's a really great ball striker and he's hitting the ball really well right now. He's in some really good form. Uh, ninth off the tee, 23rd ball striking, 23rd birdies are better, 47th in putting from five to 10 feet. Uh, I think he's doing you know, pretty well um, in the recent form category. 13th at the Barracuda. Uh, he made a pretty good charge too on Sunday. So I like guys that make that late charge on Sunday, roll that into the next week. 30th at the John Deere, 8th at the Travelers, 14th at the U.S. Open. So he's doing it in multiple courses, a lot of different kinds of courses. Uh, Nick Hardy is a really good young talent. I like uh, he's maybe even a little bit more polished than Gaurup, you know, might have seen a lot more championship courses. So uh, I think if Hardy's the pivot, then I'm going to be overweight on Hardy and just slightly field average on Gaurup. So that's that's my take on these two. Yeah, I, I really like both of these guys. I think Goddard Up's a great option. My concern, really, that ownership get creeping up. Sure. And for him, the ownership, it isn't because of the form. It isn't because of course history. It's because of him getting talked up by some yeah. certain touts, and people are, all want to play the new shiny toy here, and that is Chris Goddard Up. I, I said it when he was 10K a few events ago. That is the <laughs> last guy I would be putting in my DraftKings lineup. This week, much more appetizing here, 7,900. Um, but uh, yeah, I think a, a solid cash play. And really, he's got GPP upside. He could certainly top five or win this event. I think Nick Hardy is a much better option, right at the same price as far as GPPs. Get the leverage, get all of those people playing Goddard up. Uh, and uh, if Hardy gets one more point, you have leverage over probably 25% of the field here. So uh, yeah. I like that as a great option. Both these guys, though. Solid picks. Can we talk really quick about the forearms on Chris Goddard? These guys' yeah. forearms are enormous. They are yeah. so big. He, he just he does look like them. Bryson. He looks yeah. like Bryson. He, he, the, the, the distance numbers on Goddard are pretty crazy. 370, yeah. 380s. He crushes Ooh. the ball. And that's how, that's about much help. Now, it will be interesting to see how he does in club down situations. Uh, so that is that is part of it here at the it, Twin Cities. So. What he's lacking is experience, and he's just going to gain a ton of that over the next couple of months. The swing yep. season, I think, is going to be huge for Chris Goddard up, going to play a yep. ton of events, hopefully, and really be able to break through uh, as far as uh, uh, having some experience under his belt and putting some top tens together, something like that. So excited to see these guys. Uh, for me, though, at first guy, he's probably going to be the chalkiest of all the 7K guys, really probably one of the chalkiest, maybe top two or three on the slate. I'm projecting yep. maybe third highest owned. That's Adam Svensson at 7,600. 40 to one odds a lot to like about Spence in this week we've put him in our uh, value slides and even the sleeper slides when he's in a in a little bit tougher events uh but he's made all of his he's made his last seven cuts on tour so the excellent form four of those are top 25s actually the last four events all top 25 finishes that includes six at the Barbasol he did not play last week at the Bar Barracuda or at the uh, Open um, so I like it. the fact that he actually had a week off. He probably got here early, was out on the course, figuring it out a bit. Uh, he did finish 15th on this course in 2019, but he finished 15th and he lost five strokes putting that week. That's incredible. Wow. He had just finished even. He probably is top five, maybe even top two or three. I like that a ton. He's excellent on easy courses. Right now, the irons for him are just red hot he's been playing really really well the ball striking 13th in this field sixth on approach and fifth birdies are better his issue if you can find one really it's distance he's not the longest driver of the ball um so we'll see kind of how he gets around this course although he's proven he can uh, and the other issue ownership i think he's a solid cash play probably second guy in my lineup behind davis riley um, so I think that's a great choice if you want to fade in GPPs, uh, do it at your own risk, but at the same time, great leverage option. Uh, second guy that popped for me much lower down here in the pricing 7100 Tyler Duncan, he is a guy once again we've highlighted him a handful of times we're going to go back to him this week at 100 to one odds to win. Um, I'm much happier betting him on DraftKings. I think that's a great price on him. 7,100. I think he should probably be up by Spencer another $500 or so. He's made four out of his last five cuts. 13th at the Barbasol. He has one missed cut and 183rd on this course. But again, I said I'm not putting too much weight here on course history. Uh, he 
just like the Spenson plays really well on easy courses and uh, just a great ball striker. He's 10th in this field, 17th on approach. He's a fairway finder as well. I have him ranked 10th for fairways gained. Um, and then the long irons, he's top 20 when it comes to those distances. You quoted the 175 plus, the 200 plus. He is top 20 in both of those categories. Very good, uh, Tyler Duncan. I think he's an excellent play and he is not a guy that's going to be highly owned. It uh, doesn't matter how well he pops in models. He's just not going to get that 10, 12% ownership. I can see probably seven, eight, nine being the max, depending on what contest you're in. Um, but he's not going to be highly owned, especially with the, the Svensson and the Goddard up guys like that in this range. Um, I just don't see it. And Jay Kim, Tom Kim. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, he's mispriced on DraftKings. If you look at the the odds, the odds makers versus the DraftKings, he's mispriced on Yahoo. He's like, the 18th highest priced golfer and in DraftKings, he's what 40th or something. 70, so 7,300. Yeah. The price is wrong on him. I, I question the fact that he just played four tough rounds at the open and now he's coming to a completely different course uh, where you actually have to hit iron shots instead of uh, driver and wedge, like we saw last week. So right. we'll see how it goes. He's a very good golfer, highly talented. I think he's top 50, maybe even 40 golfers in the world right now ranking. Um, so don't don't completely fade him unless you're just doing it all ownership or sir, uh, for leverage reasons. Jake Kim, a great option, I think, in this low range as well. Yeah, you have to go back to doing, you know, four straight rounds at the Scottish Open too. You know, so sure. jump, yeah. you know, that's eight rounds of just Lynx golf for you know for you know for that last you know couple of weeks you know that's not like what he's about to experience here um he does he had a 17th at the byron nelson um but you know other than that he's only played majors over here he hasn't played you know and hey maybe he's just an extreme talent and you know getting himself on a course like twin cities that's not as hard as the other events that he's played maybe he just erupts so for that reason, I'm going to have ownership, but I think I might be slightly lower to the field on that. Maybe I'll just throw in like 10% FOMO and then just be on my way. All right. right. I'm projecting J. Kim to be more like top five owned because oh, sure. of the mispricing. If you look at Fantasy National right now, which they do a, a good job usually when it comes to the uh, projected ownerships, I think they're flat wrong right now. I don't think enough people have caught on to the mispricing. He was a, I think he was a late ad too. So yeah. some people who jumped into Fantasy National, let's say on like Sunday or first thing Monday morning, clicked a bunch of guys that they liked. They weren't clicking him because he wasn't in the list. So yeah. I think that's part of it. Uh, but expect him to be very highly owned, especially in cash or a high dollar events. I could see in uh, your hundred dollar single entry, him being like top three owned. I could see that for sure. Yeah. All right. Sleepers. Uh, not many to talk about. Mm -hmm. I, like, honestly, Rough. like my player pool might stop at either my sleeper or like 6,800. Like there is not much below that, that I'm really targeting. Uh, my guy is going to be Justin lower uh, 6,900. Now this is a little bit of experience from playing corn fairy DFS contest for, you know, about a year and a half now. Uh, that's how I know who Justin lower is. He's a corn fairy grad. Uh, he had a lot of good events um, that featured off the T statistics. Uh, he did, he is uh, 45th on the approach. Not bad. 36 birdies are better. I mean, these aren't elite statistics, 49th, 49th and par fives, but he's a good ball striker. Um, you know, he can putt when he needs to. I, I certainly am not going to, you know, place a wager on him to win, but if I need a, if I need some salary relief and I want to try to get, you know, t uh, Tony Finau and Sun JM in the same lineup or some kind of construction that's high nines and Tony Finau, you know, and I got to play a guy like lower then I'm going to try, but honestly, I'll be peppering much, much of that 7k range and low 8k range. That'll be like the highlighted ownership for me this week. Sure. And then I'll try to change it up at the top. Um, but yeah, uh, last week he was uh, 16th at the Barracuda. I had that wrong. I, I, when I saw it last, he was eighth. I thought his round was over, so maybe he bogeyed the last hole. <laughs> but eighth at the Barbasol and 51st at the John Deere Classic. So back-to-back -back top 20s for lower. I mean, he's he's not in terrible form. He's done it at a couple of courses now. So maybe uh, maybe he's just riding a hot, Maybe this is the, the start. The start of the incline for Mr. Lower. Uh, your thoughts and your favorite sleeper. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll ride that train with you to see how Lauer does this week. <laughs> I'm I'm going uh, with a guy that disappointed absolutely everybody the last time he oh, was yeah. out, and that is Adam Shank. He was, I think, like the second or third highest owned golfer or something yeah. at the John Deere. He finished his round one. I think he had a 79, and he went ahead and withdrew. He decided he had had enough of the John Deere classic after well one day. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm looking at this as a DFS revenge spot. A lot of people will not go back to Adam Shank this week after what he did to them. But if you look at the field, this isn't all that much better than it was right. at the John Deere classic. And is Adam Shank I'm not hearing that it was a major injury or anything like that? I think he just wasn't feeling it anymore and he was already out of the tournament at that point um so he's got everything with all the reasons everyone wanted to play him at the john deere classic still ring true and he doesn't really have any rounds of stats to refute that because they give him withdrawal and they don't worry about the stats uh, he's got two top tens this year he has two made cuts out of three tries at this event irons have been very good lately minus the john deere classic uh and he's good at, on bent grass greens. He comes in this field 15th uh, long term bent grass putting. I'm thinking like 6% ownership for him. That'll drop to like a 3% ownership if you're playing single entries. Give me Adam Shank at 3% owned for all the reasons I played him at the John Deere Classic. I could see him as an excellent bounce back spot um, and really just get some revenge on the DFS Scots uh, for what they did to us at John Deere. Uh, so that is my uh, sleeper this week. Awesome. Yeah. Ride the ride shank and uh, hope everyone decides not to after getting burned a couple of weeks ago that I love the call. All right. A one and done's uh, for the week, man. I really did not want to talk about this slide. <laughs> Rory. Yeah. You're killing me. Oh, you, you just played so conservatively and got got, I mean, and I hate to say it, but uh, I love your pick. You know, I already talked enough about Finau, but go ahead and t take it away. Yeah, I mean, he's right there with Davis Riley. I'm going to probably play more Davis Riley on DraftKings, but give me the Cameron Davis here for one and done. I think he's got just as much, if not, maybe not a tick better upside than Davis Riley. I think for DraftKings purposes, uh, though, I think Riley's due for more birdies. Cameron Davis is, is due with that a little bit higher a ceiling. Give me that for um, the one and done lineup this week. Uh, it's been a crazy bad season for me in one and done. So maybe I can pick up a couple down the stretch here. Uh, we yeah. Plus last week, first place was uh, Cameron. Second place was Cameron. And so this week, how could it go wrong picking Cameron? That's, <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Love it. Love it. Uh, that's awesome. Hey, maybe two wins down the stretch. You sneak in. We'll see. As long as <laughs> I'm, I'm on, uh, as long as I'm on the same win that you are, um, it will get us, get us into the money, get us cash. And, but, uh, I'm afraid Rory might've blew my chances. We'll see. All right, guys, that'll wrap things up for this week's video for the three M open. Uh, John, are you, are you going to the event? I am trying. I actually have family in town. So the um, question is, who can I convince to go with me? There you and then go. we're there and which day. So uh, we'll see. Trying to get out there. Went a couple years ago and it was super, super fun. Uh, got to watch uh, Hideki for a while. Phil for a little while. Morikawa, Wolf, all those guys. That was really nice. cool to see. I'm hoping for the same scenario this year as far as getting to watch guys like Chris Goddard, Davis Riley, guys that are not going to have the masses following them. I do not care to follow around 400 other people to watch phil and watch this week hideki is who that's going to be i would yeah. much rather uh hang out with four or five other people and follow davis riley around for 18 holes there you go awesome stuff john thank you as always guys you can like this video comment below with any questions you may have find us on our discord channel for any update on the cheat sheet that john just posted and uh our core lineups or any live chat and questions that you may have and you want to get a hold of us quickly as possible that is on our twitter handle at fsi underscore dfs or on our website fsidfs.com we are producing podcasts now so you can find us on apple podcasts and spotify uh if you are having trouble with your youtube channel or anything like that or anything that arises or you just wanted to you know keep your phone on you know turn your phone off and you wanted to hear it on spotify sometimes i'll make sure i do that too uh so i totally get it you can find us now on fsi's uh dfs podcast on spotify and apple Podcasts. awesome guys thank you for listening in and enjoy the 3m open good luck